Today we're going to take a look at an old English epic, an Anglo-Saxon epic by the name of Beowulf. It's one of the most famous works that have come out of Anglo-Saxon England. Um, it was a work that was lost for a long period of time, and when it was rediscovered in the 17th century, it was kind of put on a shelf and ignored for a long period of time after that. It wasn't until really the 20th century that attention has been given to this wonderful poem, you, basically um, thanks to the work of scholars like J.R.R. Tolkien, which really brought it to light as an important work of literature and not just a, you know, a insignificant little product of a past age. So tonight what I want to do is take a look at a little bit of the background. We're dealing with a new culture, the Anglo-Saxon culture of um, Britain. And I want to cover a little bit of the historical overview to put the story into context. We'll talk a little bit about some historical elements that are in the Beowulf story. And then we're going to spend the rest of the lecture dealing with the story itself, the plot and some of the themes along with it. Okay, so let's take our attention over to Beowulf, Lord of Rings. Uh, speaking of Tolkien, I thought I'd add that as our little subtitle here, um, basically because of a reference that I found in the uh, version that's been given to you in your textbook. Okay, so I want to come back to that idea of rings. It becomes a very important symbol uh, in the Beowulf story. There's a lot of uh, reference to rings, but I'm going to hold off on talking very much about that right now. So let's take a look at the land of the Britons. Let's start with the Britons. This is a pre- Anglo-Saxon population, the, the Celts of the island that is known as Britain. And let's start with kind of the Romano-Celtic period. Okay, this is some stuff that we're going to look at down the road when we get to King Arthur, but I'm going to give you a quick overview today because it does relate to the Anglo-Saxon culture, okay, or what develops into an Anglo-Saxon culture. Around the first century, middle of the first century A.D., You've got the Roman invasion of Britain, the official Roman invasion of Britain, uh, under the emperor known as Claudius. He sends in Aulus Plautius, who basically conquers a good portion of Britain, and you have various commanders in the first century that continue to press Roman advance throughout the island. There's a particular resistance uh, per, uh, given by Caraticus, who leads, you know, kind of an alliance of British tribes against the Romans. For a while, he's ultimately defeated by 51, and then the Romans continue to press forward. They go all the way up into the north, okay, even to, you know, the area that is currently called Scotland, even though they don't ever really conquer that. We'll say that the Roman conquest is ultimately completed by 84. That was under um, uh, Julius Agricola, who was the governor at the time in Britain. And it was Wales, which is on the map here. I need to call your attention to the map every once in a while so that you can see where we are. But the green area on this map is really what is uh, today called Wales. Okay, That was one of the last parts of Britain that was conquered by the Romans. And it was probably mainly conquered. We don't want to say it was completely conquered. There were still some territories that were never fully subjugated. Anyways, the Romans ended up making a boundary in Britain up in the north where you see on the map a thing called Hadrian's Wall. You may have heard of Hadrian's Wall. This was built around 122 AD. Now, Hadrian's Wall is the northern boundary of Roman territory. The Romans decided it was a little too difficult to go any further further north. They had to deal with groups of people known as the Picts. There weren't any Scots, by the way, at this time. There were Picts up in the north, and they were pretty difficult to deal with. Plus, the terrain was kind of rough, right? The mountains and that kind of stuff. Not the ideal situation for the way the Romans deployed their legions in battle. But uh, they kind of call it quits at that point. Not that they don't go beyond that because... Later in the second century, they actually do attempt to take more territory north of the wall, but ultimately they fall back on the wall. Okay, so the next thing that I'm going to bring up is really a legendary element. This is a uh, reference to these two characters, Fagan and Deruvian, who are um, missionaries, Christian missionaries, supposedly sent by Pope Eleutherius to convert the Britons to Christianity. And the traditional date is given around 167. Now, this might not be historical, historical but... What we do know is during the second century, you start to have more and more Christianization take place in Britain. Right? The Celts, these early people, pre-Roman, um, they had their own gods. All right? they have, uh, it's, it's a paganism that was predominant. And of course, Romans come in, and they're also pagans. So you've got pagan culture established, 
and then Christianity is going to come in on top of that. It's kind of a complicated web of uh, religious development that takes place in, in Britain, um, something that I'll probably go into a little bit more when we deal with King Arthur down the road. Okay, But for now, let's just say Christianity begins to spread around that time. Also, the Romans start to make defensive uh, structures to kind of watch for incursions from Germanic tribes, particularly Saxons, coming over from the continent to the islands so around 270 AD. You've got the Saxon shore fort system being constructed. These are kind of watchtowers along the coast for this new problem. And the Saxons are going to remain a problem. As a matter of fact, ultimately, they're going to come in and take over the entire island or most of the island. By the end of the 4th century, the Romans are really trying to fight off incursions from the Saxons, but also from the Picts in the north and from the Scots. And these Scots happen to be from Ireland. Okay, So again, the Scots are from Ireland and the Picts are from Scotland. Might be a little counterintuitive because things have reversed right now. Not reversed, you don't really know of any Picts today, but um, this was the situation. The Romans provided the defense for the Britons. Now, at this point, Rome has ruled the island for close to 400 years. So you have this whole process of not only slow Christianization through missionary work and stuff like that, but also Romanization. Roman culture begins to merge, which is why we call it kind of Romano-Celtic Britain. These are not the same Celts as there were prior to the Roman invasion. Now, Rome's occupation is going to begin to um, cease by the time we get to the early 5th century. In 406, you've got a really cold winter where you've got the Rhine frozen and you've got barbarian tribes that were north of the Roman boundary kind of sweep down into Roman Gaul, Suevi, Alans, Vandals, Burgundians, and they ultimately are going to sever contract between Rome and Britannia, okay, Britannia being the Roman name for Britain, okay, that was across the way. So these barbarians kind of isolate Rome. Rome withdraws some of their, has already withdrawn, by the way, some of their troops to fight against the barbarians in Europe, and at this point, there's really only one legion left in Rome. And then in the year 407, the general, known as Constantine, is proclaimed emperor. He's known as Constantine III, emperor um, in Britannia. He crosses over into Gaul, actually removing the final Roman army away from Britannia. And at this point, Britain's kind of cut loose, okay? Britain is then attacked again without the Roman defenses by Picts, Scots, and more and more Saxons. By the year 410, the Roman emperor Honorius basically says, you know, Ro you know, Britain, you're on your own. Okay, and Romans have officially, like I said, cut off Britain. They just couldn't govern there any further, right? It was too, too much going on um, to maintain their control over other territories. Now, this is where we start to move to the Anglo-Saxon invasion. Now, some of the figures I'm about to give you are historical, but they've really been embellished by legendary, uh, uh, later legends, I should say. Uh, the figure of Vortigern, someone who we'll talk about again when we deal with King Arthur. Really interesting figure, interesting stories that are told about him. We don't know exactly who he was, when even he lived, but I'm going to give you the date of about 425 for Vortigern, who would have been a British leader possibly a high king over the Britons at the time, though there's all kinds of debate as to how you understand this guy. But the traditional story is that Vortigern, in order to deal with invasions from Picts and Scots and other Saxons, invites Saxon mercenaries to defend the island. The Gallic Chronicle says that in 441, Britain, which had been abandoned by the Romans, passed into the power of the Saxons. They call this the um, ad, uh, Adventus Saxonum, the ad advent or the arrival of the Saxons. We're going to put that date at around 450, just to give a, a general date. There's all kinds of debates as to whether this was earlier um, or not. But either way, the story is that Vortigern welcomes the Saxon leaders, Hengist and Horsa, to Britain, and he's going to use them to fight you know, his battles with the Picts and others. And then Hengist apparently has his son Octa come over to the, the, to the island with, you know, 16 ships of other Saxons. So you got this massive influx of warriors who fight the Picts, but then they decide they're going to stay. Okay, that's why we can call it the arrival of the Saxons. And then the story is that Vortigern's own son, Vortimer, um, rebels against his father's bad policies and wages war against the Saxons. And what we do know about the late 5th century is that the... British tribes and then the Saxon groups ultimately divide the island, okay? The Saxons kind of press forward for a while. And if you're looking at this map, you can see all the black 
um, lettering, those are the territories controlled by the earlier Celtic peoples. In the red and the brown, those are the territories that are controlled by the new arrivals, the Germanic tribes from the, con from the continent, Saxons, Angles, Jutes, etc. Okay, so you can look at Britain at this point as divided in two. Um, by the way, we get most of this material on Vortigern from a 9th century historian known as Nennius, uh, the Historia Bertonum. Um, actually, it's you know attributed to Nennius, but a lot of people d doubt that he actually wrote it. Anyways, around 456, you have this uh, supposed battle at Ellsford, where the Saxons are fighting the Britons, and you know we have the situation that I just described, so I'm not going to go any further describing it here. Um, one other figure that we're going to talk about when we get to King Arthur is a figure by the name of Ambrosius Aurelianus, another individual that is credited with trying to defend Britain from Saxon invasion, and we're going to put his dates at a little bit closer to the end of the 5th century. Okay, So a lot, a lot of mysteries surrounding these individuals, but um, we'll spend time dealing with that later. So. Ultimately, the Britons are not going to succeed in keeping Saxons from spreading across the island. Um, it becomes the land of the Angles and the Saxons, so we're going to eventually have what we call England, all right, coming from the word Angle, the English language from the land, uh, language of the Angles. Around 519, we have the Kingdom of Wessex founded by Cerdic. Wessex on the map, you could see that at kind of the southern portion there of, the, um, uh, of, of Britain. In the later 6th century, close to the turn of the century, in 597, the story is that um, Christianity is brought to the Saxons. So I already talked about the Christianization of the Celtic people, but when the uh, Anglo-Saxons arrive, they're bringing with them their Germanic paganism, uh, which are gonna, they're going to worship gods very similar to what we've already seen among the Norse. Okay, so you're going to have another attempt to Christianize these new pagans. And the earliest convert here is um, Ethelbert of Kent, all right, a king that converts to Christianity. The next figure that I'm going to mention, and this is going to be more relevant to the story of Beowulf, is a guy by the name of Redwald, who's key, uh, king of East Anglia, part of what's known as the Ophingus dynasty. In East Anglia, you can see, on the eastern portion of Britain on the map on the screen. Okay, his date's 599 to 624. Around 620, we hear of a missionary by the name of Felix, who is sent to evangelize the Angles, and Raidwald actually is the first king who apparently converts to Christianity, the first Angle king to convert to Christianity. All right, so that's going to be important. Uh, later in the 7th century, 682, um, it said that the West Saxons end up driving the British as far as the sea, Okay, the British of Dumnonia, if you look at the bottom part of that map, Dumnonia is basically what's known as Cornwall now. Uh, that was a, you know, in the blue areas, by the way, those are going to be the British holdouts where the Celtic people remain present. Um, you know, they're pushed really all the way to the edges of the island at that point. Okay, Wales, uh, Cornwall, etc., and, and of course Scotland in the north. By the 8th century, 779, Offa of Mercia, which is in the central portion of the island, proclaims himself king of all England. Okay, and again, England being the land of the Angles. Okay, but it doesn't mean they're necessarily united as a single true kingdom at this early date. That's actually a process. So if we move a little bit further forward, we could see some of the other individuals that are going to uh, bring Anglo-Saxon unity. Later, again, 789, you've got the first Viking attacks. Uh, and this is going to be very relevant also to the story of Beowulf because the Beowulf story is actually set not in England at all, right? It might be an Anglo-Saxon text, an Anglo-Saxon epic, but Beowulf is very much a Scandinavian, Norse, um, Viking-type hero, okay? So the Vikings have a, a big presence here as well. Between 802 and 839, this is the, the reign of King Egbert of Wessex. He was the um, Bretwalla of the English kings, basically kind of the overlord of the English kings. And it's really through him and his sons and grandsons that you have more of a unification of the Anglo-Saxons. Um, if anybody's seen, oh gosh, what's the series that's on Netflix? The Last Kingdom, I think, and uh, this, the, also, the other movie, not Last Kingdom, though that is also relevant. Um, the History Channel Vikings series deals with King Egbert. Um, anyways, Egbert ultimately defeats uh, opposition by the Britons, who have united with the Vikings at the Battle of Higsden Down. After his death, you have uh, leadership passed to his son Ethelwolf, 
and his sons. So between 839 and 877, you have Ethelwolf, Ethelbald, Ethelbert, Ethelred, kings of Wessex, and increasing unification. But the really pivotal character is Ethelwolf's other son, Alfred, known as Alfred the Great, 871 to 899, who is really supreme monarch in the vicinity. All right, he's just, uh, it says that all English submitted to him except those that were under the power of the Vikings. So he's really becoming the first great king of England, okay, in a unified sense. In 901, you've got Edward the Elder, who takes the official title, King of the Angles and the Saxons. And I'm not going to go any further forward. There's a lot of history that I'm obviously not even touching on. But um, we could think of Anglo-Saxon England as coming in a way to an end by the turn of uh, well, middle of the 11th century, okay? So 1066 is a date that used to be memorized by all school children in the Western world. This is the time of the Norman conquest of England. William the Conqueror arrives uh, and kind of changes the game. The Normans take over. And the Normans also are Viking, all right? The Normans happen to be the Northmen who had settled in France uh, not much earlier uh, under the um, uh, leader Rollo. Okay, so that's basically the, the, the culture that we're looking at. It's this Anglo-Saxon period. So the story of Beowulf is linked to this period between the arrival of the Saxons, and the, um, the initial arrival of the Saxons, and the arrival of the Normans. Okay, when the story was written down, that's a matter of debate. Let's talk a little bit more about the actual historical setting for the story itself, because it does seem to include some historical pieces of information. Not that we can say we can identify a Beowulf in history, but we can identify some of the other characters that show up in the story and in the poem. All right, on the map you can see, again, Scandinavia. You're looking at Denmark right there, Sweden. At the south you see what's called Gotland. Okay, this is the land of the Geats. This is where Beowulf would have been from. Okay, this is just off the map. You could actually see Britain located kind of off to the, um, to the west there. Germany just below. And the setting for the story is really the 6th century A.D., okay? How do we know this? Well, important figure that's mentioned is a guy by the name of Hegelic, King Hegelic, who died around 521. He was a historical figure, figure um, and we could find where he's mentioned in the history books. Gregory of Tours is the historian who mentions him in his book known as The History of the Franks, all right? So this is 6th century um, it refers to him by a very different name because he's writing in Latin, Clocalicus, who was a Dane who raided um, Frisia and died in the raid in 521. He died fighting the Franks, and the Franks were led by Theodobert, who was the Merovingian prince. He was the son of the Merovingian king of the Franks, by a guy by the name of Theoderic I. Now, we also see his name show up in a couple other works that definitely link him to Hegelic because the Liber Mostrorum mentions him as Rex Gitarum, meaning the king of the Geats. And we have another document, this, that was from the 7th century, another document from the 8th century called the Liber Historiae Francorum, which mentions him as the Rege Gotorum. So very similar, but you're clearly talking about this territory of Gotland, um, the Geats, and obviously in the story of Beowulf, Hagalic is the king of the Geats. He is the king who precedes um, Beowulf, not immediately, but he's a predecessor of Beowulf. And he's the king on the throne when the first action in the story takes place, basically the story of Grendel. All right, so that's what we know from Beowulf. Actually records this raid on Frisia as well. That's how we can make this identification. It records that Hegelic not only raided Frisia, but he died in a conflict that involved the Franks and the Merovingians. They're mentioned in the text. Okay, then he succeeded by Herdred and then Beowulf after that. All right, so there's a historical figure. That's how we can place it into its historical context, and that's always awesome. That's always fun. But we can get a little bit more information when we start looking at archaeological records. All right, now the 7th century, there's different theories as to when the poem really evolved or was composed. One theory is that it was composed during the 7th century, even though it's set in the 6th century, it was probably composed later, probably an oral tradition originally, um, and it may have been composed in East Anglia. And one of the reasons for this happens to be some archaeological finds, particularly a very important ship burial that was found at a place known as Sutton Hoo. You actually see in the, the black and white photo on the screen the archaeologist excavating this ship burial. But the Sutton Hoo burial was an Anglo-Saxon burial mound. Um, it had this you know, funerary 
boat um, with all the grave goods, including this helmet, which is really, really awesome piece of artwork. This is a reconstruction, by the way. The original wasn't quite preserved this well, but um, the artwork is exquisite, right? The metalwork and the detail is um, amazing. Now, Beowulf actually opens with a funeral scene. It opens with the scene uh, where you have the funeral of a guy by the name of Shield Chafing. Okay, he is um, uh, an important king who's going to be the ancestor of uh, King Hrothgar, okay, one of the important figures in the story. And what we find in this archaeological site is kind of the, the, the material culture that seems to be reflected in the poem. So it gives us you know, images to put with the poetry. Right? So when you think of Beowulf, you might want to think of him wearing a helmet like this or you know, fighting and sailing in a ship like the one that was found here. Now, this particular burial site has been identified um, as the burial mound of Redwald, the very figure that I mentioned earlier. This is the king of East Anglia, okay, mentioned in the Historian Bede and the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, who converted to Christianity. So if this is his ship, or if this is his burial, as many people indicate, um, you know, this could be the connection um, to the story. And I'm going to elaborate on that in a little bit, but again, it's, it's um, East Anglia theory that we're talking about. Anyways, um, let's go a little bit further and explain how this connection is being made. The king, Raedwald, was part of the Ophingus dynasty, which I mentioned earlier. Now, the Ophingus or Woofing dynasty of East Anglia were related to the kings of Uppsala, Sweden. Okay, and the Geetish Wilfings, that's a, a clan uh, that is mentioned in the story of Beowulf. As a matter of fact, Beowulf's dad, uh, Edgthiau, kills a Wolfing, ends up being exiled, and he goes uh, to Rothgar. Rothgar is the guy that ultimately pays the Weir Guild to um, kind of ransom Ethgio. Um, Rothgar happens to also be married to a Wolfing. So here you've got these characters that are from this particular family in the story which is why people think it's probably in East Anglia that this story was composed because of the prominent position these Wilfing or Ufingas kings play in the poem. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. We may have found you know, a figure from that very dynasty uh, that represents that very culture. There's another theory. There are actually multiple theories, but another theory is that it was composed during the 8th century in West Mercia. And this is because of the figure Ofa the Great, who was a great king of West Mercia between 757 and 796. And his ancestor, a guy by the name of Ofa the Angle, is mentioned in the poem as well. So there may be you know, a case to be made that it was composed outside of East Anglia. But either way, it seems to be including interesting historical pictures, interesting historical characters, and possibly different traditions merging together into the poem that we have today. Okay, so let's talk about the epic. The earliest manuscripts we have date to around 1000. Um, when the actual poem was composed, we don't know. Um, it is not attributed to any particular name. We don't know who composed it. Um, we've got the Noel Codex. Um, it's an early copy that we have. The copy is probably of an earlier manuscript that dates back to the period that we just discussed, 7th, 8th, 9th centuries. And the language is in Old English, which I just mentioned. Now, when I use the term Old English, some of you have already heard this. You know what it sounds like. Um, not everybody does. When you hear the term Old English, the tendency is for people to start to think of Shakespeare or something along that line. Now, Shakespeare is Middle English. Shakespearean English is, um, you know, the English of the theater, number one, and it's easily recognizable as English. I mean, you can listen to somebody reciting lines of Shakespeare and you know that they're speaking English. You might not ever understand everything they're saying because the vocabulary might be a little bit different from what we use today. But if you listen to and read enough Shakespeare, you can pick it up pretty easily and follow along pretty well. If you were to hear Old English or Anglish, it's going to sound like a totally foreign language. It's going to sound more like German, which is what it is. It's a, you know, English happens to be um, a German-descended language. So I'm going to play for you the opening lines, which you see on the screen is the uh, opening line, opening, um, what is it called, page <laughs> of the Noel Codex. Um, and I'm going to walk you through, I'm going to underline the text as the reciter recites it in Old English, so you could just hear what it sounds like and appreciate um, the rhythm to it. I mean, there's obviously, it's, a po it's poetic. So, here we go. What way gar dena in yar dagum feud kuninga thrim ye frunan huta athalengus elen fremid 
Oft shield shaving, shad and a threatum, money go mag through mero set the off there. Okay. And you probably didn't understand anything he said, with maybe the exception of Shil Schaefing, who's the figure that I just mentioned, whose funeral opens the poem. So here you are in the very first line talking about this king. And you might not even have caught that. So it sounds very, very different. But this is English. Okay, surprisingly, it's English. Um, but you get a little feel for the poetry, how it would be read, how it would be recited. Okay, just like Homer or in the Iliad, uh, it would be recited with a particular meter. Okay, so you see the same thing here. But, of course, this is different from Greek poetry and their different little conventions. Like I said earlier, the, the, the text is rediscovered after a long time, really lost on a shelf somewhere, in the 17th century. And then I mentioned earlier when we opened the discussion that it wasn't really brought to um, appreciation until scholars of the 20th century bring attention to it, like for instance, J.R.R. Tolkien, who actually has translated the poem um, in, into English, I think in a couple different uh, versions he's, he's done the translation. Anyways, a little bit on Anglo-Saxon sex, sex, mm, <laughs> Anglo paganism, because the religious worldview that's presented in the poem is also interesting to talk about. Um, you've got kind of a mixture of traditions. Anglo-Saxons, again, are Germanic, and like other Germanic tribes, they worship some of the same gods that we've seen before, the pantheon that we consider kind of the Norse pantheon. So some of the names that the Anglo-Saxons would have worshipped are names like Woden, okay, another version of Odin, or Loge, which is the god Loki, Thunor, which is Thor, right? So you could kind of tell that they're the same figures. Um, we're more used to seeing them in the Norse version. Um, Tiu, the god of war, Frigga, um, you know, the wife of Odin, Frey, you know, again, we've seen them. Well, what you have, again, with the advent of Christianity into Anglo-Saxon England is Christianity starts to slowly replace the paganism, and it takes generations, centuries, before it's fully Christianized. But by the time we have the epic of Beowulf, you see definitely a Christian overlay on top of that paganism. All right, so the Epic of Beowulf actually reflects the transition. You can still see some of the pagan underpinnings, some of the pagan elements in the story with an overt Christianity on top of it. And I'll kind of point some of the stuff out as we get into it. One of the most important concepts that is emphasized in the course of the poem is the concept of weird or fate. All right, this idea that there are things that have been kind of determined beforehand. I know we've talked about that concept we definitely talked about it when we talked about Oedipus in the very beginning, this idea um, that uh, destiny. Oh, well, again, again, we can go back to the uh, early story of the Enuma Elish and the conquest of Marduk when he defeats uh, Kingu and takes the tablets of destiny from him. That, that scene in the Enuma Elish, again, an, another example of fate. So in lots of religions, not just the you know, Anglo-Saxon religion, there's this concept that things are controlled. Now, the Veard... We see this concept again in Norse mythology. The Norns, I don't know that we talked really about the Norns, but they're these maidens that we can consider them the fate maidens. They're counter counterpart to the Greek fates. But the Norns, Urd, Verdandi, and Skuld, you even see the word itself, weird, in the, the name Urd. Urd and weird are the same root, basically. Okay, So the idea is that all living subjects, living, living beings are subject to fate. Now... When you have a Christian context that this story is put into, you still have the idea of fate, but fate is now in the hands of the Christian God, okay, of the single God, the one God, who controls all of these things. Now, I don't want to make it sound like this is a purely pagan concept, because even within Judaism and Christianity, as well as other monotheistic religions like Islam, you do have a concept that God controls everything ultimately, right? There's some kind of... Um, what is it called? Providence, at least, maybe even predestination of sorts. It depends on your theology, how strong that is, but it's not a foreign concept to the biblical tradition. But you do see an interesting weaving together of the Anglo-Saxon idea of fate and the Christian concept of fate. Okay, so we'll take a look at that when we get to some lines of the poem in a little bit. Now, other aspects of Anglo-Saxon Germanic culture that are important to point out that are going to set the stage for the story are ideas like comitatus, which is this idea of a relationship between king and thane, thane being the one who swears what we call fealty to a king. 
to the overlord. This is an exchange, a contractual agreement where the king provides honor, goods, protection in exchange for the thane fighting for him. Uh, we see this situation really throughout the Middle Ages, this idea of uh, the feudal system, uh, land grants and stuff to people in exchange for military service. This is kind of the setup, and this is prominent in the Anglo-Saxon culture. This idea of giving gifts, giving these things in exchange one for another, and part of that has to do with glory and honor, because it's really important in these heroic stories to look at the whole idea of, you know, what do I get for the um, risking of my life in this combat? Am I going to attain glory? Am I going to attain honor? And that could be a physical thing, right, in the, in the actual form of a reward. Now, we're going to take a look at how this is dealt with in the story because it be, plays a really big role, particularly with the relationship between Rothgar and Beowulf. Anyways, the other aspect of this is the importance of kin in Germanic culture, the relationships of family, extended family. When we talk about kin, this is not just your immediate family. This is, you know, the tribe well beyond the family. As a matter of fact, the whole idea of tribal systems are organized around this idea of an extended family, right? You're not talking about huge, huge communities where we can consider them nation states like today. But, um, you know, you've got the king, you've got the family, you've got, you know, the clan, the tribe. These are kind of outward extensions of that family unit. So that's going to be really important as well. And then you've got this last concept of Wehrgeld, or Wehrgeld, which is this idea of a blood payment for the loss of a life. This is something that we took a look at when we studied the Volsunga Saga. If you remember the scene where Loki kills Otter, the son of Reidmar, and Reidmar demands Wehrgeld, which is you know the gold that was going to pay for his son's life. And this was a way that the Germanic culture dealt with this idea of vengeance, right? It's kind of a limit on vengeance or family feud one family and another. So, you know, prior to something like this or prior to some kind of judicial system or system of trial or legal system, you've got the idea that if somebody murders somebody in your family, you turn around and you get vengeance by going and attacking their family. And of course, that just escalates and escalates until you've got this, you know, rivalry, um, a blood war, a family feud. It's where the whole, you know, if you've seen the video, not video game, but the, 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 uh, the game show, Family Feud, that's where the name comes from, this, this idea, families fighting families. Uh, Hatfields and McCoys, if you're familiar with earlier American family feud history. Anyways, let's move on to the poem. We've got kind of the cultural stuff out of the background. Um, what you see on the screen is actually a, a reconstruction of that ship burial, the Sutton Hoo ship burial, so you would look, know kind of what this would look like. Now, the poem, like I said, opens with a funeral, the funeral of Shield Schaefing. He's described as a ring giver. So I want to pay attention to this title. I said pay attention to the word ring. And pay attention now to this idea of giving gifts, because those become really important for the culture. The ship burial is what takes place in the story. They describe a ship burial for shield chafing with the treasure and the wardress, all these kind of things laid out, and then the ship would be set adrift, literally to sail to the afterlife. This is an image we see in mythology, right? The crossings, crossing of the water to the other side, Okay. And you've got gold and silver and jewelry and weapons, all these kind of things placed in there with the corpse, right? That's exactly what we found at Sutton Hoots, what we find in the poem. So again, the archaeological evidence kind of supports this image that we get in the poetry. The poetry is accurate. It's depicting actual practices of the culture. And it's also interesting, by the way, not that, that the poem opens with a, with a funeral, it's going to end with a funeral, okay? I kind of like it when a, a poem does that nice bookend technique. Let's take our attention now to the plot. We're going to start with the king known as Rothgar, king of the Danes, and his hall known as Herat, the hall of the heart. He's a shilfing, a shielding king. So he's descended from Shildchafing, the guy whose funeral is mentioned in the beginning. Now his hall is a mead hall. We have already dealt with the great mead hall of Valhalla in past mythology. Again, this is the center of the culture. This is where people gather to eat, to drink, to tell stories, to be entertained by the poets, to um, play Viking games, that kind of stuff, right? So it's a center uh, piece of the culture. And the problem in the story is that this hall is being terrorized, right? He's got this wonderful hall, Herat, but they can't use it anymore because there's a, a monster that has been terrorizing, devouring men, and they let, then have to leave it abandoned. And it's sit, uh, sat abandoned for about 12 years before the arrival of Beowulf, right? So things are very bad. And now let's take a look at who's terrorizing the hall. 
And this is one of the most important figures in the story. This is the character Grendel. When you think of Grendel, you think of a character that is a monster, usually depicted as a monster or a giant in the story. And he is monstrous. And this is going to interestingly be not just a monster story, but it's a, a, a connection to the Christian tradition, which I mentioned earlier. If you read the text, you may have caught the name, who is the ancestor of Grendel. It's a figure that we show, shows up in the book of Genesis in the Old um, Testament, a figure by the name of Cain. Now, the Hebrew, Cain, means creature, Cain. And the story, if you don't know the story of Cain, it's a, a story of murder. Cain murders his brother Abel. He's the first murderer. And because of that, he's cast out. He's uh, put a mark is put on him, and he's essentially cursed. And they draw on this idea in the story because the idea is Grendel is a descendant of this cursed line, which has produced giants and monsters and all kinds of stuff like that. Okay, so he is human, but he's a deformed human. He's a corruption of humanity. And you're not supposed to be sympathetic to Grendel. I know sometimes when you see a movie version or other versions that have been written down that kind of take the story from Grendel's perspective, he's a much more sympathetic character. But in the original, he's not supposed to be uh, anything like that. He's the bad guy. Now, he's the problem for Rothgar. Um, And they actually indicate in the story that Rothgar thinks this curse that has come upon him has to do with his thanes, his people being ignorant of God and the proper worship of the true God. So there's this Christian element again. It's this kind of this idea that, you know, if we fall back into paganism, this is the consequence, right? Just like Cain was cursed, you know, here is the curse of Cain coming upon us, okay? And what we need to do is, you know, fix that. So again, you've got this kind of undercurrent of Christian virtue and proper worship that's built into the story. All right. So here's the problem. Now we got the solution. Shows up in the figure of Beowulf. He is the greatest warrior. As a matter of fact, when Beowulf arrives by ship, the Coast Guard who's watching uh, the shore comes down to meet them when they get out of the boat. And one of the things he says is, you know, I, I noticed that one of you is the greatest warrior I've ever seen, which is an interesting line if you think about it, because he doesn't know who any of these guys are. He's never even seen them fight, yet he's already responding as if he's witnessing the greatest warrior in the world. And it's purely based, again, on appearance. That's all it could be based on. What does the guy look like? Well, he's obviously big. He's strong. He has an imposing presence. So he has to be um, the greatest warrior possible. But the character of Beowulf is going to be somewhat of a, a figure with a reputation that has actually preceded him. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what motivates him to arrive at this pivotal moment. And it happens to be um, this idea of fame, honor, and also duty, right? His motives are multiple. He's interested in fame, he's interested in honor, but it's also a duty. Now, the duty has to do with this kinship relationship, this um, guest-host relationship, as a matter of fact. If you remember, I mentioned earlier that Ekthiao, Beowulf's dad, had murdered a Wilfing. And Rothgar paid the Vergild for Ekthio. So Ekthio is this bond to Rothgar, who supported him and cared for him. And that relationship from father um, is passed down to son. So Beowulf's coming to rescue basically another family member, essentially. It's a family friend. It's a kin bond. Okay, so that's a dutiful thing. If he should attain fame and honor in the process, you know, that's just a bonus. So let's talk a little about this guy, Rothgar, because he really is, I think, one of the most important figures in the story next to Beowulf. And in many ways, he might be even more important than Beowulf. And I'll I'll explain why in a little bit. He's described as a ring giver, um, which happens to be a kenning. I'll talk a little bit about what kennings are in just a second. But it's descriptive. When he called called him ring ring giver, just the way Shield Schaefing was described as a ring giver, this is a a way to refer to somebody as a king, somebody that gives rings, because the tradition was for the king to accumulate when a war band went out and fought a battle and accumulated, you know, the booty from the, the battle. Everything would be given to the king, and the king would then be the one who distributes these things to the community. All right, so he's a ring giver. You know, that would be just one element, one of the things that he distributes. Um, and in a way, this is also an indication of somebody who gives honor. Okay, he's a gift giver. Honor, but it's also a symbol of wisdom. And that's going to be very important. So the idea that we get from Rothgar in the description is supposed to be showing us that he is uh, a perfect example of a good king, okay? He's a man who gives gifts. Just think of that in contrast to Agamemnon from the Iliad, right? This is a man who 
takes honor away from his warriors. He steals the um, prize of honor, Briseis, from Achilles, which leads to the whole epic poem going off in a negative direction for Achilles. Okay, Rothgar, not like that. So that's a good thing. Okay, so that's important. Um, anyways, let's go on and talk about what a kenning is since I introduced the term. And if you read the poem, you're going to come across, even in translation, a lot of times the translators are going to use, uh, well, you can't miss it. You can't miss the use of kennings throughout the poem. A kenning is essentially a metaphor. It is what we call a metonym or a metaphor, depending on, I mean, not all, they're not always metaphors. Metaphor being, a, you know, when we use kind of figurative language to describe something uh, via a comparison, right? It doesn't use like or as, but um, it's not literal, right? We don't take metaphors literally, but sometimes metonyms can be taken literally. So I'm going to show you some examples of that in a second. But it's the form of a descriptive compound. It's usually built on two terms that are linked together that are going to uh, c communicate characteristics, actions, or um, the usage of various things that are being described. So for instance, here's some examples. Killer guest. This is a kenning that describes Grendel, right? He is not literally a guest, right? So it's kind of metaphorical. Um, he's definitely a killer, but gives you an idea what he's like, right? He's the guy that shows up at the hall and starts killing everybody. Um, not too bad. Warrior. Uh, you could use the term spear bearers, right? These are the guys, you know, it really is fairly descriptive, so it's not necessarily a metaphor. It literally describes what they do is they carry their spears with them, so they are warriors. Body warden. This would be a description of the armor that you wear, the mail, the chain mail. Whale road would, it would be a kenning for the sea. The one I like is word hoard. All right, this is a reference to vocabulary, um, how you use your language. A lot of times these characters will be you know, described as unleashing their word hoard. So not only are they warriors who fight with weapons, they're warriors who fight with words. And we'll see this in a little bit when we get to the conflict between Beowulf and Unferth in the story. But this idea of being able to wield your vocabulary in a certain way. Um, same thing, the horde, right, you've heard of that. We talked about a gold horde that Fafnir protected. So it's this idea of, you know, this bundle really of vocabulary and you want to have a, a large word hoard. Then you've got names which are also kennings. They might not be as easy to recognize but Beowulf is a compound uh, that means bee hunter. Okay, which is a reference to a bear, right? What, what do bears look for? They're, they're the guys that hunt down honey, right? So a bee hunter is a reference to a bear. So that describes Beowulf. He's not literally a bear but he's a big powerful warrior figure so it's appropriate. And then his own dad, his name is actually interesting for a couple reasons. Egxiao, which is, means sword servant. Okay, so it's again a kenning, sword servant, which describes a warrior. So it tells you a little bit about him. But just the first part of his name is interesting. The word, the E-C-G, the ek, or edge, as it's often pronounced, that's what's called a synecdoche. Synecdoche is a type of... Um, metonym which uses a part of a thing to stand for the entire thing. So the ek or edge means sword in Anglo-Saxon and it literally refers to just the blade edge, that's where we get the word edge from, from that word. Okay, so it's referring to the edge of the sword but it refers to the entire sword. Okay, so that's this idea of a, a synecdoche. Anyways, don't really need to go too much further in that but um, these things are functional, these little phrases, these little stock kennings, because they are going to actually aid, some people think, the shop, which is the poet who recites these things, in the actual storytelling, in the composing, if he's you know, doing what's called oral composition. So it has a function, kind of the way we talked about earlier with epic meter and um, stock phrases and formula and stuff like that, helping you compose on the fly as you sing. So that might be the situation for the composition of Beowulf. Anyways, moving on with the story. He arrives, and his reputation precedes him. And this is where we get to this guy, Unferth. Unferth is one of uh, Rothgar's warriors, and he's a skeptic. He does not believe Beowulf is everything he presents himself as. And there's a reason that he actually believes Beowulf is more bragging than anything else, is because he's heard about one of Beowulf's supposed um, competitions. Uh, not supposed, a literal competition that he had. And he's going to start to challenge Beowulf's re uh, rep reputation right there amongst the men. And it has to do with a race. It's actually a swimming match between Beowulf and a guy by the name of Brekka. Now, Unferth knows that in this race, Brekka wins. So Bre Beowulf's you know, presenting himself as this uh, you know, great hero, and yet he couldn't win a swimming math match against a guy, Brekka. You know, he's obviously not as good as he claims to be. 
But of course, Beowulf has an answer. Beowulf explains that, you know, while the match was going on, I happened to be fighting off sea dragons and serpents, so a little bit distracted. So obviously, Brecco was able to win, but I have a good excuse, right? So that's how he responds. But um, setting the record straight is one thing, right? He's defending his reputation, he's defending his honor. But then he's going to turn around. Oh, and by the way, uh, I should bring this up. Uh, he does say he's saved by Veard, right? He says it's fate that saved him from dying in the midst of this race. Now is when he turns the tide on uh, Unferth. Because I said, like I was trying to say, he protects his reputation, sets the record straight, but then attacks Unferth in response. You can't just let somebody attack you verbally. You don't just want to make your defense. You want to make an assault on them and what he does is he accuses Unferth of being uh, the murderer of his brothers. He kills his own brothers. And this is really kind of drawing on that theme we saw with Grendel, right? Grendel happens to be a descendant of Cain. This is the ultimate murderer of one's brother. So he's, in a way, comparing Unferth to this, this cursed story, this, this character who's obviously the bad guy in the tale. This is where Beowulf ultimately kind of releases uh, his word hort, right? He's doing verbal combat with his opponent. Um, and he makes a point. Okay, now, the cool thing about the story is ultimately Unferth is going to come to be a fan of Beowulf by the end of the tale. Uh, but at this point, a little bit skeptical. So is Beowulf going to prove himself? Uh, before we get to that, let's actually talk about his attitude. Um, we just said in the in the race he attributes Veard, right, his, his, his uh, salvation to fate, right? It's fate that saved him. So I want to talk about this idea of facing one's death and the concept of Veard from a pagan perspective. The phrase that's uttered over and over again in the poem is that Veard weaves as it must. Now, before he goes into battle with Grendel, which we're going to get to in a second, this is what the text says. He says, but send back to Hegelic, his king, if battle takes me, in other words, if he dies fighting Grendel, this excellent war shirt shielding my breast, my finest cloak, it's Rethel's heirloom, Wieland made it. Wieland's another figure from um, mythology. It's a great blacksmith. Um, fate will go as it must. There's the line, right? We Veard weaves as it must. The idea here is, if I die, it's my time to go, right? This is nothing I can change. Fate determines things. This is out of our hands. But more than just if I die, I die, it's the idea that if I don't fight, if I don't go into battle and it's my time to die, then I'm going to die nonetheless. No matter where I am, I'm going to die if that's my moment to die. And of course, as a warrior, you want to go out in battle. Right? This is the hope of getting to Valhalla for the Viking. Right, If you don't die in battle, you don't want to you know, you die back home miserable the way Enkidu did in the Sumerian story, sick in bed. Uh, you need to go out as a warrior. So this is his attitude, and this is a consistent attitude throughout the story because he realizes in all these situations that he could die, but he keeps putting in, in his mind that, you know, if it's my time, it's my time. I'm going to do what I need to do, and that's important. The Christian concept of fate, again, I just want to bring in one more time because it's in the hands of God. God in the story is the one who determines one's fate. This idea that it's predetermined by the Christian God if he's going to die. And he specifically relates this to God in the text we'll see a little bit later. All right. So with this attitude, he's going to go and do combat with Grendel. This is the first of three important battles in the story. Now Grendel is lured back to Herat. They occupy it, they sing, they eat, they feast, they make noise to lure Grendel into their trap. And he's absolutely committed to the trap, so much so that they pretend to go to sleep at night. And the lights are out. And as Grendel approaches and comes in, creeping into the, the hall, he goes through some of his men. He actually attacks some of Beowulf's supposedly sleeping men and begins to devour them right then and there. And Beowulf, and this is the part that disturbs me when I read the poem, is he just lays there pretending to be asleep rather than get up and save his men who are being killed. But again, this is his commitment to the trap. He's not going to let the trap spring too early where Grendel might flee. He wants to get his hands on him, and that's exactly what he does. They grapple in hand-to-hand combat. And it's gory and it's graphic and the description is brilliant. You can hear as Grendel panics, realizing how powerful this guy is, he pulls away and you hear the sinews snap and eventually the arm comes ripping off of Grendel's body and he retreats into the wood, you know, bleeding. And they assume, of course, that he's dead because who could survive 
loss of an arm, right, without medical attention. So um, this is proclaimed as a great victory, and the arm is then hung in the hall as a trophy, and Beowulf is rewarded. They, of course, pursue Grendel. They never find the corpse. They track the blood into the wilderness, and on the way back from this tracking, the shop, the poet, sings praise of Beowulf. And this is where we get the reference to that story, Sigmund the Dragon Slayer. Talked about this when we did the Volsunga Saga. I said the earliest reference to the story of Sigurd is found in the epic of Beowulf. But it is not the version we get in the Volsunga Saga. Sigmund, remember, is the father of Sigurd. Sigmund in the actual Volsunga Saga is not a dragon slayer. He kills a werewolf and some, a lot of other people, but he's not a dragon slayer. His son Sigurd is a dragon slayer. Beowulf's poet apparently had a different version in mind. Okay, so the whole idea of this comparison uh, is twofold. It shows, number one, that Beowulf is like this great hero, Sigmund, right, who is described as the son of Vales. This is the Volsungs. Okay, but it's also foreshadowing the second part of the poem, where Beowulf himself is going to do battle with a dragon. Okay, more, more people are familiar with the Grendel episode than the dragon episode, but, you know, this is going to be the ultimate, um, you know, arch nemesis at the end of the story, the alpha predator, the dragon which we continually see over and over again in mythology. Now, the honor that's bestowed upon him is at the hands of Rothgar. Rothgar, before Beowulf fought Grendel, um, engaged in gift giving, right? He gave gifts beforehand, which is interesting in that, it can't be really viewed as honor, the idea of a reward for what you do, but it's kind of a preemptive payment. It's kind of a wise use of your funds to secure loyalty. This has more to do with that comitatus. I'm going to give you gifts to secure your loyalty. You're going to fight for me. And he gives them you know, useful gifts like swords and helmets and those types of things. But he also gives rings, armbands, the jewels that are going to be able to be shown off and displayed. And he gets more of this stuff after the victory. So he's a man, Rothgar, who is wise. He uses his goods to secure loyalty and get the soldiers to fight for him, kind of like when you hire somebody to work on your house and you pay a little bit up front, but you pay him the rest afterward. And then he bestows honor at the end, okay? So that's important in his, his character. Remember, he is the epitome of the good king. The second battle follows shortly after, right? Grendel's out of the picture. People go back to celebrating and using Herat as a party place, but it is interrupted very, very quickly by another terror that comes from the wood. This is Grendel's mother. They don't ever give a name for this character. It's simply Grendel's mother in the text, and Beowulf's not even present at the time when Grendel's mother first attacks, but Aisher, which is a friend of Rothgar's, is killed, which, of course, bothers Rothgar greatly. The mother takes the arm, the trophy hanging there, retreats back. Um, and of course, you need to now deal with this. You know, you can't just let this go. It's possible that the, you know, the hall is going to have to be shut down again unless they can track her down and deal with her. And Beowulf agrees to do this. What you have in this part of the story is the underworld journey. This is the part of the story that we see over and over again in these hero stories. And it's a really well done description. Um, he goes into the dark wood, right? He takes his journey with his men. And he tracks Grendel's mother to this lake, this um, murky, dark water in the middle of the wood. Again, you should already be picking up on the imagery, the water. What he needs to do is he needs to go into the water because Grendel's mother lives down in a cave below the water. Now, at this point, Unferth, who is previously a skeptic, has become the biggest fan of Beowulf. As a matter of fact, gives Beowulf his own sword, Runting, tells him to take that into battle. Beowulf descends into the lake, and this is the scene that always I don't know, reminded me of when I, my, my childhood when I, when I was little and I watched the movie Jaws for the first time. Um, if anybody's seen the movie Jaws as a child, um, it's terrifying. I know the special effects are a little bit outdated, but still, it's a terrifying movie. And when you go and swim in the ocean after you see the movie as a little kid, this the only thing you can picture is what's right below me that I cannot see that sees me. And that's the picture you get with Beowulf in the lake. Beowulf jumps into the water and it's pitch black. He can't see his hands in front of his face. But Grendel's mother is right there in front of him. She sees him clearly. And, and it's like, you know, something bad is about to happen. And then she grabs a hold of him and drags him down, down, down into the underworld, literally into the underworld, because they're going to come up inside the cave, inside her lair. This is hell. Okay. Now, she holds him so tight that he actually can't draw the sword and this descent. And they describe 
um, Beowulf as Lord of those rings at this point. So there's that little phrase, Lord of rings, that I uh, gave in the subtitle. This happens to be a reference not to a ring, but actually to the um, rings that make up his, his, his mail, his mail protection. Okay, again, he it says it's, it's, it's that which actually saves him from being pierced by her grip. Okay, so she couldn't get through it. That's his protection. So the combat then follows. In the combat, the sword that Unferth gives him is not effective. It breaks. He needs to find another weapon, and he luckily does because in her cave, there are these things up on the wall. One of them happens to be this giant sword, this jewel-hilted, um, wonderful blade that ends up being powerful enough to dispatch Grendel's mother, which he does. He kicks down the sword. He kills her pretty quickly, and then... He cuts off, well, yeah, he cuts off the head of Grendel. Grendel's body happens to be there, and he's going to take this back up. So you have the ascent from the underworld. So he goes down, and he comes back. But by the time he gets back, he's already been abandoned by Rothgar and his men. The only people that have remained loyal and stood by him happen to be his geats, his, his, his band of warriors. They stay there and wait. And then some of them actually carry this giant head of Grendel back as further proof that they've you know, attained their, their, their goal. That's essentially the end of the first two combats, and we're right at the edge of the first part of the story, the end of the first part of the story. But I want to finish up by looking at Rothgar's advice. This is always important to get back to the theme of the story, and one of the themes happens to be the idea of how you use your, um, your, your wisdom, how you use your wealth. Rothgar, like I said, is the epitome of the good king, and his advice is supposed to be advice for the future Beowulf, who one day is going to be king of his own people. And he warns Beowulf of pride. Okay, this is kind of like Phineas giving the warning to Jason in the story of the Golden Fleece. As you know from that story, Jason doesn't listen, right? Jason falls into the, the pride of hubris by the end of the story. It's pretty much a tragedy in that sense. So Rothgar is going to give similar advice to Beowulf, and he says, you know, do not become overconfident in yourself. He warns him of fame leading to this pride. And the uh, truth is, you know, our lives are short, right? As a matter of fact, this is where you kind of get a Christian message in there too. Life and fame, these things are gifts from God. They're things that you don't take with you. I mean, fame can endure after you, but you don't take this with you into the afterlife, right? They're fleeting things. Our strength you know, here in the present is gone down the road. When you become old, as a matter of fact, Rothgar has already suffered from this. He clearly couldn't protect his people the way he might have when he was a younger man. And he's telling Beowulf, you know, you're going to get old too. You're going to be king. How you use your time here is really, really important. Okay? And he advises him specifically to be a gift giving king. Be the type of man who is generous, right? We could also interpret that as an idea of generosity. And the idea is you accumulate wealth and power, and if you don't use it here, you can't take it with you. All the money that you accumulate is useless to you in the next life. What you need to do is use it here and now. Use it to um, give honor to the people that deserve it. Use it to form these bonds, these kinship bonds, the comitatus. Use it the proper way. And again, he points to himself as the example of the good king. And what we want to do in the rest of the story, of course, is see has Beowulf listened to the words of wisdom? Has he followed the example of Rothgar? Or is he going to go the way of Jason? Right? That's a potential. So we're now going to fast forward because the story does that. It's going to jump from part one to part two. You get the death of Hegelic, the king of the Geats, um, on that raid to Frisia, which I mentioned earlier. And then Beowulf ultimately becomes king shortly thereafter and reigns for a period of 50, 50 years. So that's our flash forward, 50 years down the road. And what we have is a, a gold hoard in a barrow, in a burial mound, guarded by a dragon, right? This is what we love in these stories, right? This is um, the hobbit all over again. Now, there was a ring keeper who was the sole survivor of a tribe that buried this treasure in this mound. Uh, the idea that, you know, all this glory, all this wealth, it's all ephemeral. All men are going to die. And now this barrow is occupied for the last 300 years. It's been guarded by this dragon. Unfortunately, there's a slave, a thrall, who has wandered into this barrow and has come upon a gold cup. He decides to steal this, thinking the dragon is not going to miss one little piece of gold, but he doesn't really know how careful dragons are in counting their um, their goods. And the dragon notices, and the dragon wants vengeance. He comes out, and he's going to start to terrorize the Geats. And King um, Beowulf is now going to have to make a decision. What does he do? What does he do? 
Well, he's going to do the right thing. He's going to follow his dharma, and he's going to do battle with the great fire worm. There's another canning for you that describes the dragon, right? This is the worm that, or the serpent that breathes fire. So it's, again, descriptive and poetic. Now, this is reminiscent, again, of Sigmund that was mentioned in the first part of the story, and Grendel as well, right? This terror that comes at night. Here's the dragon that comes out at night. He's going to be the new Hrothgar, right? The old man who has to defend his kingdom, and he's going to do a different job than Hrothgar. He actually is going to go forth and meet death head on. And this is a terrifying moment because he's not as strong as he was. He's already won his fame, his reputation. He can't really lose that now, so you can imagine he didn't really need to go um, into battle for those things. But he does see it as you know, his duty as king, right, to protect his people. And he sees the whole problem as maybe a punishment from God, right? God's sending this, this dragon upon us. Um, he needs to redeem um, himself in the kingdom, perhaps. And he chooses to do this single-handedly. His men who go with him, he tells them to wait at a distance. He's going to go in and face him all alone. And again, his attitude, very consistent. It must go as fate decides, the Lord for each man. So here you can very clearly see the reference to God, the Christian God, the Lord, tied to the idea of fate. So when he says, as fate decides, meaning how the Lord decides is, is the implication there. Right? So his hands are in the hands of God. And unfortunately, the battle doesn't go very well. So the text shortly thereafter says, fate did not give him glory. Right? And again, this just seems to be a very impersonal personification of fate, more like you might expect from a pagan tradition. So like I said, the pagan idea is kind of under the surface. The Christian stuff is kind of on the top, but it's a mixture. But what do you do? What is he going to do? Let's take a look at the response of his men as they watch their king being devoured by a dragon right in front of their eyes. Um, Beowulf does, in a way, look back at the value of life in his last moments here, which is interesting um, because, again, with this attitude that fate weaves as it must, you know, he's always had the attitude, if I die, I die. Yet here he is actually dying, and he starts to think about how precious life is. And that seems to, again, possibly be, you know, Christian influence, right? The value of human life, which is really central to um, Judeo-Christian tradition. But either way, let's take a look at the guys who are now watching from a distance, his warriors. You've got this heroic code, this comitatus bond, and you've got the idea of what it means to be a warrior in the Germanic sense. The Germanic warrior code, I don't think we've really talked about too much, but it works out something like this. The leader, who is the one who bestows honor and gifts upon his men, is the one who goes first into battle. And the warrior's job in the war band is to defend the leader up to the point of death, right? You follow into battle. You don't retreat unless the leader retreats first, right? You follow the example, but at the same time, you never try to exceed your leader. You never try to steal the glory from the guy you're following. The sad thing is the thanes at this moment who are watching from a distance panic when they see their king um, being devoured, and they run They've already received gifts, they have this bond, but they don't live up to their oaths of fealty. Abandoning him in this last moment, with the exception of his nephew, the really important figure of Wiglaf. Right? Now Wiglaf is watching and he sees his men run away, and he's going to remain loyal. But it's interesting because he actually stops before he goes in to aid Beowulf and gives a lecture to the guys that just ran away. Kind of this dramatic pause. In an emergency situation, it's a little bit frustrating reading the poem when he turns around and lectures these guys. He needs to you know, really get down and help Beowulf, but he doesn't. But again, that's part of the, the poem. Um, and he kind of reminds them of their duty and what they're shirking and you know this whole idea of um, loyalty. Anyways, he goes down. He helps Beowulf. But the interesting thing is, even though he stabs the dragon, he allows Beowulf to get the kill. Right? He follows the code appropriately. He doesn't abandon his king. His king hasn't retreated. Neither does he. He doesn't steal the king's honor. He lets Beowulf win the victory, but he's there to help it. And because he does it so perfectly, he earns succession. He is given the throne after Beowulf's death, and this is the moment of death. This is Beowulf and the dragon, kind of like Thor and Jormungand, the, you know, the world serpent. They just destroy each other at Ragnarok. Same thing. Beowulf wins the victory, but is so mortally wounded um, that he dies very, very soon after. One of the first acts of king, uh, kingship that Wiglaf does is he exiles those men, right? The Thanes and their families, the ten men that refused to abide by their oath. 
and abandon their king. They need to be exiled. I mean, if anything matters within the kin community, within the comitatus, this idea of upholding your duties. If you don't uphold your duties and you really don't have part of the community, you need to be kicked out. It's appropriate punishment, uh, just punishment, not just for them, but their families with them. Okay, this is incredibly, incredibly important. And of course, with the death of Beowulf, you have a final funeral in the story, which is where I want to get back to this idea of Lord of Rings. In the Rosenberg text, which is the one that was assigned for the semester, she uses this to describe Beowulf near the end of the poem. She calls him Lord of Rings, and it's definitely an allusion to Tolkien, without a doubt, who was one of the great scholars that dealt with Beowulf. Um, But it also creates a link to this concept we've been looking at throughout the poem, this idea of being a ring giver, right? The king description, the kenning that describes a good king. Beowulf is literally called a ring-giving lord or a ring giver at various places. Those are just a few of the references. By the way, the numbers on the screen happen to be the lines of the poem. Line 2311, 2345 are two examples of him being called a ring-giving lord. All right, and it's supposed to indicate his wisdom. As a matter of fact, it's supposed to indicate to you that Beowulf has abided by the advice of Hrothgar. He lived up to the idea of being generous and being a man who bestows honor on people who deserve honor. This is incredibly important. He does not go down the road Jason went down. Right? He is a good king, just like um, Hrothgar, his mentor, even though briefly, still we can see him as a mentor figure. Um, he has a funeral. Uh, they have, a, again, a ship burial type of a funeral, not a burial at you know, a ship uh, funeral at sea. He's actually put into a barrow with all the gold uh, put in with him, very much like the Sutton Hoo ship burial that we described earlier in our discussion. And then just to let you know, again, how good a man he was, it's interesting that we end the poem with another description of Beowulf right here. And I'm not going to do this one in Old English. I'm going to do this one in modern translation. It says, They said that he was of the kings of this world, the kindest to his men, the most courteous man, the best to his people, and most eager for fame. So where the you know idea of fame and glory was important to him, that's not a bad thing. It's not supposed to be a negative in any way. You should never think these heroes are petty because they seek fame and honor. But the other descriptions really show you that he's a man who cares about his people. He's kind. He's courteous. He has the qualities that Rothgar admonishes him you know, to, or not admonishes, but advises him to embrace, right? Fame, glory, reputation, to kin, to tribe, to oneself. He is the great hero of the poem. So, with all of that being said, hopefully you got a good feel for some Anglo-Saxon poetry. We talked a little bit about how it's structured with the use of cannings and stuff like that. But the plot, again, um, you could see the various elements of the hero's journey that we keep going back to over and over again, particularly the idea of him being incredibly courageous, facing death, literally descending into the underworld, returning again, winning the victory. Um, Even though he dies at the end of the story, you can even see the conquest with the dragon or the combat with the dragon as another descent, right? Into the dragon's cave, into the lair, into the underworld. Um, He does die, so in that sense it's a tragedy, but at the same time, you kind of have a happy ending in that you know that he becomes the right type of man, right? He becomes... Not that it's a huge transformation story, but all these hero stories are about transformation. And uh, one of the things that you want to end up with on these stories is the character embrace the virtues and values that we we're hoping he embraces, which he clearly does. Okay, so for that, um, for this discussion, I think that's it for Beowulf. Next time, I believe we're moving on to King Arthur. We're going to still be sticking with um, Britain, but we're going to be going back to the pre-Anglo-Saxon tradition from the Celts themselves. We're going to deal with the wonderful story of King Arthur. 